Yeah. One, two, one, two. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hi. Uh, Aaron Kadadan, one of our uh, BA acting students in his final year. That was fantastic. Um, right. Hi, everyone. I'm Rotomir Kintete. I'm the Associate Dean of Students here at UAL. Thank you very much and welcome to uh, the University of the Arts and to Black Man on the Couch. I recognize a few faces, so there will be one or two of you that have been here to one of these uh, events before, which is fantastic. For those of you that are here for the first time, coming to the first time of, um, to one of the events, thank you very much for being here. Um, just a couple of things before we start. Um, I don't know how much you know about counselling. Um, I've been a counsellor for about 25 years or so now, and there are normally some rules that we do follow um, in counselling. One of the, the biggest and most important rules is confidentiality. <laughs> now, obviously, we're not going to be able to be confident uh, be confident in this session because we're in an open session, so it's not a real counselling session. I would encourage you to tweet and also as well to provide feedback because it's the feedback and the tweeting that allows us to continue this and to develop it as it goes on. So please feel free to do that. Use your uh, social media to, to pass the message on. There may well be some subjects that we discussed tonight that might be triggering, that might be triggering for you and your own personal circumstances. If that is the case, we do have some counsellors and psychotherapists around. I have um, the head of the Counselling Health Advice and Chaplaincy Service here, Marie Khan. Marie, are you anywhere? She's right at the back there waving, and her colleague, <laughs> Nicola Nicolau. Both of them are here. If you do need to speak to them, please find your way to them. We do have counselling rooms nearby. They can sit down and have a chat with you. So please, you know, feel free to talk to them. They're very, very friendly women. Um, the way that this um, evening will go is that I will be talking to my guests for around 45 minutes, slightly shorter than a, a counselling hour, and I'll try my level best to use counselling skills. We haven't planned any of this at all. I have met my guest only once a couple of weeks ago, went to go and see him at the Young Vic just to let him know what he's letting himself in for, <laughs> but that was it. Um, I've got a couple of pre-planned questions which I would like to, to weave in, so I'll try and do that as we, as we go on. After about 45 minutes or so, we'll have a five, 10 minute toilet break, and then we'll come back and we will open the floor for you to ask questions of both me and my guests, uh, Kwame and Aaron as well. I will be asking Aaron to join me up here as well. So if people wanted to find out a little bit more about his experience as a student here, then of course you'd be able to do that. Or to ask me about counseling psychotherapy in general, you can ask me that. Or, and I imagine what will happen, is that of course you can ask, you can ask my guests questions as well. Okay, without further ado, if I can um, please invite Kwame Kwayama up on stage. <laughs> so, Kwame, welcome. Good to be here, yeah. I think. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, welcome to Blackman on the Couch, and welcome back to UAL. Yeah. Um, as already stated uh, by Sim, you used to be a chancellor here. What does it feel like coming back? Uh, beautiful, actually. Mm. I have such fond memories okay. of this university. I was also a student here, oh, so right. I was at LCC, um, and so uh, I learned so much that here, and evidently not too poor for you as well as me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so it feels, it feels kind of wonderful to be back. Okay, good. And slightly frightening, let me be real. Um, I've, 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 I've not done therapy before. Okay. I've, I've, I've not sat on the couch before. Okay. And so uh, I'm a bit like, okay, okay, I, um, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be open and uh, I will try and be open. Well, it's not surprising that you feel like that. Uh, lots of black men, black boys in particular, yeah. will have issues around counselling psychotherapy. I mean, I think, you know, one of the reasons why they may well not attend when needed is because there's a fear and a lack of knowledge as to what it is. What we're going to be doing is necessarily having a conversation with some aspects of counselling in it, but really as a way to present to others that really what you are is you're relating to someone and in conversation with someone, and you know, you might use it to share some of your problems and concerns and hopefully become a bit more self-aware. Okay, so my first question then to you is, um, can you tell me about your father? Yes, I can. Uh, my, father, uh, my father died um, probably a year ago, uh, this month. And, um, and my father, I would describe him as, as a man of his error. Um, I, I often say to my children, I wish you to judge me by my dispensation and not yours. Um, 
and he was an Edwardian man. Edwardian man. Edwardian, you mm -hmm. know, the, the Caribbeans we w w were taught, um, some might say Victorian manners, but, but the, the way, you know, the kind of stiff upper lip, the kind of silent man, not too communicative, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of things that we would associate with, with, with people who were born at the beginning of the, or the early part of the 20th century. Um, I, would, I would describe him also, however, as someone who absolutely loved his family. He loved his children, but he absolutely loved his mother, his aunts, his sisters, and his community, I, I, I mean, in a profound way. And then the only other thing I would say about him is that he could really boogie. Mm -hmm. Like at every party, my father was right at the center. And, uh, and now, you know, at our, at our I would say Christmas, I don't really celebrate Christmas, but at our family gatherings around New Year and throughout that period, um, the kids, the grandkids, and now the great grandkids, um, you know, part of the tradition is to dance like granddad. Mm -hmm. What kind of music was he? Soca. Okay. Soca and calypso. He was like hardcore classic soca. You know, like, you know, Lord Kitchener, Sugar Boom Boom. <laughs> them kind of, <laughs> them kind of lick there. Okay. So, tell me about where he was born, where he came from, Good. when did he arrive in this country, if he did? Yes, yes. My, my father was born in the West Indian island of Grenada. Mm -hmm. uh, he came... Uh, and he was born into, into an Agarian, almost, uh, society. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a fisherman. Actually, very interestingly, the year that my father came, I discovered much later that unemployment in Grenada was <laughs> roughly 68%. And, and my father would tell me a, a, a story that, uh, that, 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 that meant a lot to me. I, I, was, I said to him once, I said, why did you come to England? And he said, well, one day I was, uh, uh, you know, I went to knock all my mates and to see who wanted to go out and lime. And they'd all gone to England. <laughs> and so I figured I might as well too. And even if I just do the ship ride and I land and I see it, and then I come home, I'll be good. Mm. Um, so yeah, he, he came here in 1960 okay. and, uh, and moved in with his sister in Labrador Road. And where do you fit into all this? Uh, partly what I'm asking is, what of you is your father? Um, I, I, I think I have my father's uh, physical, uh, his physique. Mm -hmm. And my, my father is quite skinny. Well, I used to be skinny. You know, the, <laughs> the, the, the belly defies that now, but alas. Um, but yeah, so I think I certainly have, have that about him. I, I have my father's fundamental love of family. Kay. I am at my most comfortable when I am around um, those who have known me um, most of my life. Um, yeah, I think those are the things. And, and I think also, in, in again, fully being fully transparent, I think one of the things my father had um, was a, a sense of, um, a, a sense of fear sometimes about um, entering into new territories. Mm. And I recognize that in myself. But my mother, and no doubt you'll ask me about my mother at some point, so I won't go in there now, but my mother was the polar opposite. My, my father would be a man who would um, <coughs> place his hat where his hand could reach. Mm. And my mother was a kind of woman who would throw her hat from the back of the room. <laughs> and if it didn't hit, oh well, let's go again. And so uh, I, I, I think I recognize um, that of my father in me, and invariably, when I feel that, I try to challenge that. Okay, in some ways I understand why this is a fearful situation for you, because it's something new in a way that it would have been for your father. But let me, let me just ask again, uh, or at least just delve a little bit deeper about the relationship that you, you had with your father right up until he died last year, which I'm mm. sorry to hear about, by the way. Um, how, how was your relationship with him? I think it was very good, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Mm. <coughs> um, I, 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 think it was, I think it was good because I think at about 17, I understood that, um, I think I understood that 
I'm a, I was a mummy's boy. <clears throat> Everything that I am, my philosophies in life, my engine, I perceived came from my mother. Right. And uh, during that year when I was about 16, she went to Grenada with the rest of my brothers and sisters and I, and I couldn't go for a work reason, um, or school reason or something. And so it was just my father and I in the house. And I think my father grew up knowing that my mother had such a brilliant and an ebullient personality mm. that all of her children kind of revolved around her and that we were our mother's children. Right. And during that time, um, we got quality time together, time where we could look at each other and speak to each other and, and that I could under try to understand him. Mm. <coughs> and, uh, and from that moment, I think, my father could see that I fundamentally respected him and that I understood that education <coughs> was secondary sometimes to wisdom. Okay. This is something your father taught you, or you just... No, I just think that, I, I, I think I could observe that. Okay. I think my mother probably taught me it, but... Um <coughs> and, and from that moment, my father, I would always humble myself in front of my father. Um, even if he said something that I didn't necessarily agree with, that I didn't challenge him in the way that, 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 that maybe instinctually one might have. I, I always deferred to him. Um, and that allowed my father to open up, to be, um, to be open with me and to be uh, fragile if that sometimes if that was needed. Um, and so in, in, an, in an odd way, we, we, we respected each other, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When your father first arrived in this country, I haven't said anything about your, your mother and we can go straight into her if you, if you wish. Well, whenever you, whenever you what was going on for them? I mean, like for many of us here whose parents arrived during the uh, Windrush uh, era, through that time, mm. there were challenges, obviously. Yeah. Uh, was that obvious to you and your siblings um, at the time? I, I, well, my father arrived in 1960, my mother in 62. Right. They, they got married in 64, and then I was born a couple of years after Did that. they know each other from they back home? They did not know each other oh, from right. they, they met each other here. Oh, right. Um, and, then, and, and then they moved to Southall in West London. Um, and I think, again, I think it's quite hard to, um, one of my favorite sayings is history is a foreign land, they do things differently there. Mm -hmm. And my mother would often tell me stories um, of how she would go to work armed. And uh, she would have a pair of scissors in her bag because she was then working in textile and she would have pepper so that if she were attacked by any of the white males that she could throw the pepper in their eyes and run and that if it got to it that she would have an instrument to, to defend herself with. And my father would tell me stories of gangs of teddy boys coming into Southall in order to beat up the blacks and the Asians. Um, and so I, I, I was, it was quite clear when I was and I'm slightly making the age up, but I think certainly probably by the age of seven or eight, I was, it was very clear to me, probably actually before that, that we were living in a hostile land. Mm. Um, and, and so we, we, you know, we were a black household in the 70s and 80s, which meant that, um, that inside the house, um, the culture from which they came from was dominant. Mm. Outside of the house, you prepared yourself for the hostile environment which was racist Britain. And when you say you, are you talking about yourself? Oh, absolute facts. When did you become aware of the fact that you were protected when you were in a home, but once you left home that you had to protect yourself? At about five. And I, I say five, uh, at, at this stage I'm not making up it's five, five and a half years. Because I remember uh, my best friend at school at the time was a guy called John, who was white. and. Um, in primary school, of course, and, and I remember we were having a fight, like a verbal fight, I don't know, whose dad is stronger than who, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that kind of children's stuff, and then eventually, while we were, he, he said, anyway, you need to bow to me because you were once my slave. Uh, a five-year-old uh, white five, boy said yeah, this to you. Yeah, yeah, And I, I, I hadn't, I, I, I've never heard the word slave, so I, I think I probably just beat up on him a bit more, mm. and then... <laughs> <laughs> even not knowing what it meant. <laughs> and, <laughs> just that it was pejorative, right? <laughs> and, and I went home to my, to my mother, and, and sorry to keep referencing my mother, but no, cool. um, 
Uh, yeah, and I said, Mom, what, what's a slave? John said I was once his slave. And she gave me this beautifully um, esoteric reply. And she said, son, um, you know, once upon a time, uh, we were angels in Africa. And, and, and we would fly and see the world. And one day we were, we were flying and we, and we landed in the Caribbean. And we saw that the, the locals were eating salt. And we ate salt too. And when it was time to fly, we were too heavy to fly. And that's why we were in the West Indies. I didn't know what the fuck that meant. <laughs> I don't think I ever asked about slavery again until I was like 12. I was like, if you're gonna give me that kind of shit, I, I, I'm like, yo, I'm, 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 I'm out of that. And, 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 uh, and, and so, and, and I, I could go on, it wasn't until later I discovered that actually it's a, it's a West Indian folktale. Mm. In the same way that it is, the African Americans have when we could fly, that they have, and the right. Brazilians have one. Okay. And it was rooted back to a tribe from the Congo, right. who, who it was re re reputed that they could fly and flew away from slavery. But she gave me the metaphor. She gave me the, the uh, uh, at five, and, and, and I didn't get it. That's but from cool. that day, from John saying, you were once my slave, um, I became very, it became very clear to me that, um, that, that there was a different world outside to the world that was inside. As young as that, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll probably come back to, to some of those issues as we go on. I, I do want to ask a little bit about the uh, relationship between your parents, if you were able to say something about that, and also as well how you, and uh, I'm assuming you have siblings. I do. Um, how you all related as a, a family. And I only ask that because, well, in counselling, I mean, there is a field or a branch of counselling which will focus on the relationship with the significant others because there's an understanding that there is something about the patterns of relationship which you bring into your adulthood. So, mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit about the patterns of relationship between all of you that I have. I, I would say that I was, um, I was child number four of my father. He was married before in Grenada. So we had three children in Grenada. Oh, right. okay. and, and then met my mother here. And, and so I'm the first child of an economic migrant. Okay. Um, and so what that meant, but also most importantly, I'm the first child in the new land. Um, and so that meant that you know, my mother was doing three jobs, my father was doing two jobs, um, and we grew up knowing that they were working really hard mm -hmm. for us to have whatever luxuries mm -hmm. we thought we had. And that was before my mother sent me to, to a fee-paying school. Um, and, and so I would always, my mother, and again, I'm really aware that I'm on the couch, and I keep mentioning my mother, and I'm going, what does that say about me? <laughs> um, uh, Can I ask, what do you think that says about you? Uh, it says that I'm a mummy's boy, right? <laughs> and and I, I think, um, and that I miss my mum. And that I, 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 I sing praises to her at any opportunity that I can. Amen. Um, where was I now before I went into that? Uh, Sorry, we can stay uh, there if you want. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's good. Uh, and, and so, uh, as a child, as the first child in the new land, um, it meant that I had a lot of responsibilities. Um, as I said before, my mother was working three jobs, and so uh, on a Saturday morning from quite a young age, at about probably seven, um, she would say four, but I don't believe it. I uh, remember from about seven, uh, I would go to Southall Market and do the shopping, mm. and buy the fruit and the veg, and then stop by and buy the meat and the chicken, and, then, and, you know, and, and bring it home. And then by the time we got to about nine or 10, my mother had a, had a stroke. And so it meant that, uh, that the boys, and, and my youngest sister was only just born then, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But it meant that, um, that, that we had to take on a lot of the responsibilities. Mm. So I would cook on a Saturday, my brother would cook on a Sunday because he was a better cook than me and Sunday was more important. <laughs> and, um, and I would do the shopping on a Saturday morning and I would do my sister's hair before she went to school in oh the morning. Okay. She's never forgiven me for that. <laughs> 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 and uh, I've seen pictures and she's quite right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so uh, our household very much was, at, was about one, of which was about responsibilities. Um, I, had, I had two brothers and sisters with my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and I would say this because I'm the eldest, um, that um, our relationship, is phenomenally close now, mm. um, and 
know, and I think we've, we've been through um, periods where my quite dominant personality was something that probably they had to move away from in order to find themselves. When you say dominant personality, I mean, how did that develop? How did that develop? Mm. Um, I, I, I think, um, no, I shouldn't say I think, let me be real. I'm quite opinionated. Um, and I also have a profound sense of duty placed in me by my mother in particular, but also observing it in my father. Yeah. And, uh, and I was, you know, uh, particularly once my mother had a stroke, you know, it was, you know a, a lot of responsibilities. Right. Then my father was working right. double shifts in, in Quaker Oats. And so going to school teacher conferences would be on me, even when I was about 12, mm -hmm. on others. And, okay. and so, because my mother would be working and my father. So I, I, I think I developed quite a, 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 I'm saying it because I've been told it. I don't know if I believe it, but mm -hmm. I've, I've had quite a dominant personality, certainly an opinionated personality that people younger than me in my family um, had to deal with and had to negotiate with. I would, I would probably say that my children would probably feel the same way about me now. Okay. That, that they probably have to um, pull away at some point from, from the, uh, the intensity of my, of my um, sense of being in order to find themselves. And, and I'm, 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 I'm very understanding of that. And I'm assuming that those characteristics which are developed at a young age are still very much part of who Kwame is today. I think it's very hard to analyze oneself, right? Again, I'm, I'm using words like uh, dominant personality because I've been told it. I don't know that I recognize it. I've been told that I'm a workaholic. I don't rec uh, you know, I'm told it, and so I see traits of it, and so I kind of go, I figure so many people tell me it, so therefore it must be true. Um, and, uh, but it sounds like there's a level of resistance to being told that you're a responsible or a dominant person. I don't know if I feel there's response. I, 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 I don't know if I'm resisting it. I think my personality and growing up and uh, again, growing up in, in 1970s and 80s London um, has meant, and, 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 and uh, let me be really clear about that, but that white supremacy was such that, that from my education and, and socialization mm -hmm. that I found you know, white supremacy told me who I was and what I would be and kind of set a box around me. And so I am resistant to boxes. Okay. I am resistant to anyone telling me what I am and what I should be, and also possibly assigning a negative trait to that. And mm. I think if there is a resistance in me, it is that. It is that I don't want to be boxed. But I get uh, in some ways you've segued into a, a different subject. Let's, let's talk about that. White supremacy, I mean, it's a term that's bandied about a lot now, lots of discussions about it. Were you or let's say, how, how long ago did you realize that we were living in an in a era of white supremacy or that that was something to be considered, particularly for people at the wrong end of it? I think I understood it emotionally. As, um, long, as far <coughs> back as when? Uh, probably, certainly by 12. Okay. I understood, I, so hard, right, that you kind of start putting numbers on it, but and, you know, it's probably, I think I, under, I certainly understood it in relationship to my school life. I began to see that many of the black boys, and particularly when we got to 16, that many of us, when we were younger, were really cute, and then all of a sudden we got to 12 and 13, and our white teachers in particular were treating us in a different way. Our white female teachers were treating us in a different way, and that many of us were being expelled from school or suspended for school in disproportionate numbers and, and for lesser or the same as our white peers. Is this This is, no, I was now at school in Acton, um, about six miles away from Southwell. So I began to understand or to see that. Mm -hmm. And again, just in retrospect, I began to challenge it. Um, teachers would often say, you've got a chip on your shoulder. Why are you continually talking about this kind of stuff? And so if I look back, I think I, though intellectually, I couldn't put a, a, a phrase around it, mm. that I recognized prejudice. And also, I grew up, as I said, in Southall in the 1980s and 70s, where police would kick down my father's and my mother's house, the door, probably once a year, twice a year, mm. for no the reason, home the home in which I live. Wow. Going to, I saw them, well, one time my younger brother, the door kicked in and, and my smashed my younger brother and his lip was all broken. They would run up into my father's room. And again, not a, n never were we even, was it, was it the slightest hint that there was anything criminal happening, but um, they would go in, my f 
rip up my father's wardrobe, wow. break up my father's wardrobe, look in the, I mean, it was like, you know, we lived in the time I saw my cousins being arrested on the street, six policemen grabbing hold of them, and, and as one of my cousins in particular, I remember really clearly, and um, being fighting with all his might as he was a, as he was arrested, we would call him Lion from that day on, because he was like, as he was kicking up fire, it was like, Lion! <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and so, I, I, and again, the Southall riots happened mm. when I was 13, and I saw the Hambra pub burning down, and the NF went to Southall um, Town Hall, and so I was walking through the police lines as I saw the NF walk in, and Blair Peach was killed on the road. Those were the turbulent days of the 1980s. And so to, to not be uh, cognizant of the outside being cold, as I see. Mm -hmm. And also white youth culture on the whole uh, deferred itself to, to skinhead culture, even though it was listening to versions of Jamaican music. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so all of my cousins and me, we were being chased down the street daily and cut and, and right, like that was the world. Mm -hmm. And so to answer the question really clearly, um, I, I could understand it and I was articulating it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was 19 that I went, this is structural. Okay. Because what happened to him in America in the 1940s was happening to me in Britain in the 1980s. And the only way that it could be the same is if it was structural. Okay. Let, we'll probably come back to that, but let's just focus a little bit on the 12 and 13 year old Kwame. I mean, when you're telling the story in a strange way, and forgive me for putting it <coughs> this way, you've already said it's almost like something that you recognize is on the outside. White supremacy is happening there. You're, it's almost like you're sitting in a chair and you're watching it on telly or you're in a theater and you're watching it on stage. But what I'm interested in is what feelings were going on for you at the time? What internal responses did you Tremendous. have to that? Tremendous questions. Um, um, that I felt, um, and again, I have to do that in retrospect. Yeah, Sorry yeah. to not cool. answer it. But I think when I look back, I understand um, that what was being placed in my mind and my body and my soul, no, my spirit, not my soul, mm -hmm. was a sense of inferiority. Right. I was being broken. Right. The, the outside was telling me that in my home, I am special and I am loved. And in the outside, I am not special and I am hated. Mm -hmm. And I have brought that hate upon myself. And so there was the 12 year old, I remember, I can see him and sorry, feel sorry, him. I, I just want to check that. You say you brought that hate upon yourself. No, but that's what I think the oh, outside world is saying. To you. Okay. Th this, all this hate that you're right. getting is because you deserve it. I see. It's because you're an inferior. Right. And you belong to an inferior race, an inferior community. And, and so therefore, you're getting your just right, yeah. um, And so I, that, those, and also, again, history is a foreign land, I do things differently there. Um, you know, my nose, is a is is a, a a a not shaped in a European fashion, and so that was a huge thing, man. At school, it was that I was rubber lips and big nose, <laughs> and so there wasn't just a feeling of of kind of fear of attack on my life. There wasn't just that I was being told I was inferior, but mm. I personally was a freak because I had rubber lips and and a broad nose and a big nose, and it meant that some. Thank you, I feel that now, too. Thank you. The 12-year-old hears that and says thank you. Um, and, 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 so, and so there was this, there was this sense of, um, this sense of, of, a, of a, res a resistance, I think, mm -hmm. to accept the subconscious inferiority right. that was being placed on me. I couldn't articulate it then until I started reading the works of Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X. Tell us right. about that time. Um, so I think I'm, I, I think probably a, a, a more, not more, but equally important time was at the age of 12. Oh, right. Okay, still there. Is when, um, is when I remember standing in the room and, uh, we know, the West Indian and the African community were taught to, to not enjoy each other's company. <laughs> <laughs> to say it mildly. Um, and, and uh, you know, we were taught in the, the one paragraph of history that we had in, uh, in our history books. Uh, we, we were taught that we were sold by Africans. Um, and that we were different to the African. Mm -hmm. And that somehow the African was taught that, that the West Indian was this inferior slave child. And that actually there was this internal rancor that was between us that was all built into the one paragraph mm. of, of, 
black history. And, um, and so it wasn't until Roots came on television at 12 mm -hmm. that my whole world changed. Okay. I mean, like it just, and, and I remember, I was speaking about it only the other day, that when Kunta was being whipped and your name is, is Toby, is like, no, Kunta Kakai, no, Kunta Kakai. And after about the eighth lashing, he was so exhausted that he said, okay, I'm Toby. But forever told his children his name and his story. And I remember turning to my mother and saying, I'm going to do that. One day I'm going to trace our ancestry back to Africa, and I'm going to give us our African name. Mm -hmm. And she said, of course you are, darling. Now go do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that, that was... And I never really spoke about it again until I started reading Malcolm X. And then I linked, the 19-year-old linked himself to the 12-year-old. I went, oh, all of those feelings that you were having, all of those things where, um, where one of your teachers at school said, called your mother into the school, a fee-paying paying school, and said, you know, your child will never be able to speak English properly because there's something about the black jaw that doesn't quite, I mean, we're talking 1970s, 80s stuff. And, and, and it was then the 19-year-old looked back and went, oh, salt, oh, I was once your slave, oh, skinheads chopping you and shouting, nigga, we're going to get you walking. And then I went, huh. So the 19-year-old had been primed to, uh, to read the autobiography of Malcolm X and mm -hmm, go, mm -hmm. huh. And then I became magnificently angry. And my righteous rage was one that was, that could not be abated with words. Mm. It was a rage of ages. It was an ancestral rage. Um, and so I would characterize um, my 18 to 24 as being one where I read I mean, if you go to my library now, there's very little fiction. It was, I just dived hard into African history, classical African history, pre-slavery, Egyptian history. I mean, I just dived into it till, till we got to her story. I just kept going. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that, by the time I got to the end of that, I think my mother said to me once, um, you need to learn to hate the sin and not the sinner. And I was able to abate my rage and then dedicate my life <coughs> to, uh, to making sure that, that I try to erase as much as the subconscious inferiority that was placed into my mind. Mm -hmm. And just to check, you understood your mom as saying when she, called, when she used the word sinner that sinner was white supremacy? Yeah, the sin was white supremacy. Right, okay. And the sinner was, was the vessel that that supremacy was coming from, which was um, white working class and middle class people in to different degrees. Now let me, let me just ask you this then, because um, you described the rage, the inner feelings, and you know we hear this kind of thing from black men and black boys all the time, right up until the present day. And they're probably not able to describe it as eloquently as what you have. What they can say is that they have found various ways of dispelling that anger, of getting rid of that anger. Some of it is quite self-destructive. What did you do with it? How did you manage it? How did you stop it from doing any serious damage to you as an in individual, if you did? I, I think two competing things. Number one, my dream was to be uh, the black British Lionel Richie. Certainly <laughs> <laughs> uh, <so, yeah. laughs> I know I shouldn't say that now, but I'm on the couch here. So, um, <laughs> um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that my ambition um, to want to be a successful entertainer um, meant that, that I, I always had a North Star. I think my desire to not place shame upon my mother was another okay. North Star. Um, so the familiar relationship was an important container in a sense. Though. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. I wanted to make her proud of me and okay. I didn't want to bring shame on, on, uh, 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 onto her. But I also, my resistance to that question is in, is in, um, is in, somehow, in somehow taking responsibility for my salvation myself. 
And I, 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 don't, I, you know, I don't believe that we are the masters of our destiny. Mm -hmm. I mean, we contribute to our destiny, but I don't know that we are the masters of, of it. And there are times... Sorry, uh, just before we move off of that, could you explain that just a little bit more? What do you mean, we are not the masters? You mean... You know, I, I happen to, though, would not describe myself as religious. I rather describe myself as spiritual. Okay. And I, I, I believe in the spirit, and I, and I don't believe that, um, that, that everything that happens to me is of my own volition. Okay. Um, I, 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 I just, I know too many things have happened in my life where I've said I'm going left and something has made me go right, and whatever that something is that has made me go right and I was supposed to go right was not me. And, and how did you come to that kind of understanding? I mean, you haven't mentioned anything about your family being, well, of a particular faith or that you, you had yeah, a faithful yeah, upbringing. Yeah, I grew up, I, I grew up in, um, m my mother's phenomenally, or was phenomenally religious, and, and okay. our family is, I, I mean, okay. I think I'm the, I'm, I'm, I'm the sinner in the family. Um, right. <coughs> uh, but no, certainly, certainly we grew up in a, in a relatively profoundly Christian home. All oh, right. Um, I do not define myself as a Christian, if, uh, but if I were to, I would, I would say it was my tradition is through the lens of Ethiopia and not Rome. All right. Um, and, and so I, 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 but I, yes, my, my faith was born of the, the environment that I grew up in and, and my own recognition that, that I do not, you know, whatever people want to say God or, or whatever is secondary to me. I, I just don't believe that I am the only engine in my life. Okay. So it sounded very much like, as you were approaching your 20s, you already knew or had an understanding that you wanted to work in the entertainment field, maybe? Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that time. Uh, my mother sent me to a, a stage school when I was seven, because I said that I wanted to be a singer, and I was singing in local talent contests, and kind of winning, and someone must have said, you should send her, you should send him to, to private school mm. to, to, to train that. So my dreams of entertainment was always, um, was from seven. I can't remember ever wanting to do anything else. Mm. Um, I, I got to about 19, and I think that was one of the lowest moments in terms of my own mental health. All oh right. <coughs> Go on. Um, I, I, at my school, um, I, you know, everybody expected me to be, to be the thing that I thought I was going to be, which was this successful singing version of whatever American superstar that there was um, at the time. And it, and it just wasn't happening. And, um, and, and at the time, a publisher um, heard my songs, and he said, look, you've got two good songs, and you need three. And if you get this third, um, I'm going to get you this big recording deal. And I was just like, yo, I'm here. And I was about 17. And he hooked me up with, who then was like one of the biggest songwriters at the time. And for two years, this songwriter would cancel on me every time I was about to go to the studio. Mm. And I think by the time I got to about 19, and, and, he was, and, 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 and this, this recording artist would, would call me and say, hey, I'm with Madonna. Hey, I'm with blah, blah, blah. Hey, I'm with blah, blah, we're gonna meet next week. And every time I was just going, great, um, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And, and, and it never did. And his wife would call me on a Sunday morning when I was due to go and say, I'm sorry, we can't make it. And this went on for two years. And I think at 19, I, I remember laying on my sofa in my home at the time, and I was just like, you know, look, you know what, Lord, if you want to take me right now, I'm all good. Wow. Because uh, the thing that I have dreamt about from as, <coughs> as young as I could remember, it's not going to happen. Let me ask you this. Uh, are you saying that there is something about the profession itself that in some ways causes or upsets an individual for them to have these mental health stresses, concerns, issues, or is it something that was already perhaps pre-existing or came from somewhere else? What are you saying? I don't know quite how to answer that, but what I will say is that um, the entertainment industry is, is nothing if not uh, fundamentally insecure of making. Right. Um, because the level of rejection that you have to go yes. through on a daily basis, yes. on a moment by moment basis for an actor, and I just want to big up a uh, young man, I thought that was fantastic. What you did. Yes. Um, but, the, but the moment you stand in front of an audience, mm. you, you are standing naked in front of someone that you fancy. And you're saying, do you like what you see? I mean, my brother, brother, brother touched it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then with every applause and every good review and every affirmation, you get another piece of clothes 
thing on. And by the time you get to like the Oscars, it's like a big fur coat or something. Yeah. But, and, but you still remember the insecurity of it. Mm. And so I think the entertainment, be you in music, film, dance, that you are constantly asking for approval. And, 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 and that's, that's challenging. You have to find a, a, a way to make yourself robust or, um, or, or, or you go under. So how does a, a black man like yourself that describes the harrowing circumstances of growing up in London and that comes to a place where they decide they want to work in an industry which also as well offers its challenges, how then do you manage to continue to manage your own mental health and you know, just the way you, you do things and see things? How do you do that? Again, I, 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 I think it's very hard to describe. Mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, and when I was singing, for instance, I would have a technique to deal with um, whether an audience was engaged. So I would always look as if I'm looking at this gentleman here. I'm now looking him in his eyes. But I would actually just look at the top of his head. So he would think that I was looking at him, but I wouldn't actually see what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I was on stage, I could just pitch slightly above so as not to see either acceptance or rejection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as I became um, a writer, I stopped reading reviews, um, partly because I, I didn't believe in the white gaze. Uh, we weren't calling it the white gaze then, mm -hmm, of course, mm -hmm. but I, I, I didn't believe in that. Um, and so I would find protective mechanisms by which, to, um, by which to try and shore myself up. And sometimes my mother said to me um, once, uh, you know, I was talking about mental health. We weren't calling it that then. And she said, you know, you know you've, you've, you've had a nervous breakdown, right? And I was just like, of course I haven't. I don't know what that was. And it wasn't, I didn't go and see anybody. I didn't. And, and she was like, yeah, yeah, no. You, I, I could see that you were. And it was probably around uh, 25 okay. when um, I, I think I'd had my first child. And, uh, and I've carried on in the music industry. I, and, and I suppose that's the other protective mechanism is that every time someone, I have to rely on someone. I go back to my Malcolm X and my Marcus Garvey um, readings of self-determination. And if you're going to wait for someone to give you something, then you're always at the behest of mm -hmm. them. And you're not protecting yourself. You're open. So actually, part of my life, people often said you've moved from being a singer to being an artistic director. And part of that is just going, I'm just not going to be contained by you. Um, and so I, I, I would develop mechanisms. Um, my and uh, at about 25, which is the moment that I stopped doing music, I woke one morning and uh, I had a recording studio in my house, which by today's standards probably would have been worth about 80K. And, um, and, and I woke up and I, I realized that I hadn't bathed in three days, that I was just in the studio just trying to find that track that at the time whatever recording company was dealing with me was going to just go, yeah, and put it out. And I had development deals with Sony and East West, and, but I was waiting for the big one. And I, I woke up at about 25, and I was just like, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And was this after your mother had said to you that you know you've had? No, she said that to me a bit later. Oh, right. Okay. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I was a bit like, this is either going to kill me or it's going to define me. Right. And, um, and so I woke up that morning, and I just, I called all my friends, and I said, I don't want no money. Just come to my house and pick up whatever part of piece of the recording equipment you want. Yeah. Just come and get it, and the samplers and the M1s and the blah blah blah. And people just came and they picked it up, and I never did music again. Okay. Now we, we don't have much time left before the break. Uh, a couple of things that I might want to touch on, but I do want to just revisit what you said that your mum had said to you about the the breakdown. Mm. How did you respond to that? How did you understand what she was saying? What did you do with that? Denial first, and then an understanding that 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 negotiating with the world, negotiating with my profession, negotiating with my dreams, negotiating with my life, negotiating with structures of inequality, um, that all of those things um, take a toll. And that I, I probably just thought I was down, but it was probably I was, I was in depression for probably a long while until, um, and I don't know what happened, that, um, that, that triggered me out of it. Okay. So it's not like you decided to seek therapy or get advice or support from anywhere. You just decided to, well, deal with it with your own resources. Am I saying? I, I mean, I don't know again that I was even thinking about it in such okay. terms. Yeah. 
I, I, I then, and which is why I said yes to this, back then, and, and that's probably not for everyone, but certainly for many of the black people that, that, that I um, associated with at that age, that therapy was for white folk. Mm. And so, you know, that, that we, were, we were stronger than that. They had to go and run and do that stuff, but, you know, we fought our way through it. And, uh, and, and I, don't think, you know, I, I don't think that that's, that was right, um, but it was, and so I would never have thought about it. I'd never, that was for my white middle class friends who had money to go and spend them <laughs> kind of money on running and sitting down and talking to people. What's wrong with that? Uh, mm. That would have been my attitude. Mm. So I would have had to have found my way, um, I would have to, to, to have mentally found my way um, by communicating with those that I loved. Mm. And today, your views, views changed? Um, <laughs> yes! <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah, 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 it has. Mainly because my sister became a drama therapist. Right. And because I love my sister, um, I figured that, um, that I couldn't have um, kind of pejorative views around, I had to dive in <laughs> and try and understand yeah. what what it was, A, that she was attracted to, and, and, how, and how it served. And then I understood that it has a, a, a wonderful um, place within the family. And in fact, by denying us, or denying ourselves, yeah. access to those tools are highly to our detriment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I lived in Baltimore for seven years, and I'd go in some parts of the city, and I'd see young people who would say to me by 12 that they've seen five or six people dead or killed in front of them, and you know, and, and you'd go into the inner city, and you'd go, th th these children uh, n need help. Mm. They need because this shouldn't be a standard way of living. They shouldn't be. They may not have the faculties to to process this by themselves. So yes, my my feeling around um, around therapy has has absolutely changed. Am I nervous about that? Am I nervous that uh, that 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 our culture may have swung from defining itself incorrectly by uh, its notion of the stiff, stiff upper lip to a notion that I think is uh, as apparent now of mental fragility mm. in need of therapeutic help. Do I, or support, or constant therapeutic support? Um, I, 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 I constantly ask myself those questions. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm not uh, afraid of that. I'm so afraid. Afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, My fear's gone now that the clock's off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kwame, for, um, for spending some time with me on the, uh, on the couch. Thank you. Thank you. You stay where you are. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we had started slightly late, so I'm going to have to cut the, um, the break really short. I mean, if any of you do need a comfort break, please go ahead and do that. It's literally going to be a couple of minutes, so please you know, think about dividing any questions that you want, and then we'll go straight into questions within a couple of minutes' time. So yeah, please just give us a couple of minutes if you need to. Uh, the toilets are just outside, and I think to the left. But we'll be starting literally in two or three minutes' time. That's yeah. all right with you. Yeah. Yeah, well done, man. Thank you. 
Hello, one, two. One, two, three, four. Anyone hear me? Okay, I'm going to use this one. Okay. Can you get your attention again, please, ladies and gentlemen? We were due to finish at half past eight. I'm going to probably stretch it a little bit after that, if that's okay with people. But if you do need to leave, then that's fine. But please do so quietly. Okay. Um, so the way we're going to do this for the next 20 minutes or so is just open it to the floor. Please put your hand up. Jason or one, two, one, two. 
either Jason or McCullough on the side will come over to you. Please don't start your question until you have the mic in your hand. I'd also as well like you to say who you are um, and then ask a very brief question or make a very brief comment, please, so that we can take as many as possible. I see a number of people waving already. Um, but I am going to be very cheeky and I am going to ask the very first question which I'd like you to respond to briefly if you could. I do apologize, but I've had this one in my mind for a while actually for a couple of weeks and it goes a bit like this um i mean the new year just turned and as you do you're looking at social media and um i saw a tweet from you on january the third and it went a little bit like this it's 2020 i'm resolved to talk it as i see it please stop calling me black asian minority ethnic fame i'm not an ethnic minority I'm part of the global majority. And to finish, to reduce me to a geographically specific grouping of allies is to open me up to exploitation. I'm bored of that. And while I'm here, people of color, bun that too. <laughs> as brief as you can, Kwame, just Tell us a little bit about what brought that tweet about. I mean, I think I that. said it all, right? I mean, I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what else I, 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 I can say about it. What, what, what I will say, that, you know, in essence is in 2020, in the, oh, sorry, in 2019, there was a moment where um, there was, I, I was publicly shamed and, and I got ran off kind of social media. Out oh, of excuse the me, excuse me. Uh, Aaron, sorry, I meant to invite you to say oh, I'm so sorry. Please grab a seat. Everyone, the questions will be taken over. Thank you. Sorry, Go ahead. Yeah, and uh, and so I kind of removed myself from social media a bit, and then I and then I found myself, you know, feeling all of these things that I keep saying. You know, I, I, and, and again, I, I said it. I, I I I hate boxes, right? Um, and I and I just found that the Bane box just often invariably meant that people who look like me or look like my mother were at the bottom of the list when actually it was our older cousins who were out taking the licks from the police in the Brixton and the Toxteth and the Tottenham riots. And actually then when it comes down to a distribution of, 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 diverse, uh, of diversity, that we're often at the bottom. And I'm, I'm just bored of it. And, so, uh, you know, and I'm not in relation to whiteness. I'm just, I'm just white is a color too, hashtag. I'm like, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't relate to who I'm not. I relate to who I am. So what's the alternative? What would you call I don't know, but. I, I know how I describe myself. I describe myself uh, as, as, as a, a diasporic African, for want of a better term. Okay. And that's really clear for me. Um, I, know who, I know what that is and who that is. Okay, great. Okay, for all open, the questions will be to myself as a psychotherapist. If you want to know a little bit more about counselling, obviously to Kwame as our guest um, and about his work, but also as well to, to um, Aaron as well about being a black male student in the performing arts. Okay, so over to you guys. Hello, Wayne, Mert Wayne Mertens Brown, counsellor. You talked about searching for your name and your history. I'd like to know where that led and how it impacted your emotional, social, emotional well-being, psychological well-being. Uh, great. Uh, and so, uh, from 19 to 24, 25, I did a genealogical uh, search into my family. Took us back through Grenada, back through to the very slave ports that my great great grandfather came from. Then I went to Ghana. Uh, identified that our family had come from the Gar tribe, and, and then I took on an Anne, an ancestral name. My great-great-grandfather's um, father's name was not in, entered into the lodger. Um, and so I found a Gar um, family name, and, and then Kwame for the day of the, the, of the week I was born, and Ya Thursday, which is my middle name, um, because of the day that my mother was born. Um, uh, and it changed my life. It, I mean, it just changed me. It meant that I was, and I have no judgment on anyone who carries a European name and is not of direct European extraction. I have no judgment whatsoever. But for me, it was important for my own mental health that I did not hand down to my children the name of someone who once owned someone in my family. <laughs> yeah, it, it, okay. it freed me. It made me. Um, it made me understand that self-determination 
is, is a very powerful thing. It had possibly an adverse uh, effect on my career at the time because people like going, oh my God, as an actor, you're Ian Roberts, and you know, I was working well then as an actor, and no one will know who Kwame is, but ultimately I did it for me and I did it for my children, and I didn't care who called it. So I would say it had a very positive effect on my mental health and my sense of being. Thank you. Uh, can we take a uh, question from the back and then we'll work our way around first? So, one at the back, please, first. Uh, hi, um, my name's Jenny. I'm a painter. I just want to thank you for what you said and Kwame. And my question to you is about resilience because I'm writing on the pedagogy of resilience. And to the young man who did your um, piece at the beginning, please be very, very careful when you have a situation where you as a young black man have a, a writing where you're swearing at your mum, I take offence at it. Mm -hmm. But I know that it's all in the artist. That white people do that all the time. I don't want that to be learnt by black men speaking about their mothers. So that was my... Of course. Can I, can I respond Would you like to respond yeah, to that? Yeah, no, um, no, I think, thank you for that. I, I, think, I, think, I think you're right. Um, for me, personally, when it came to writing, I remember, I remember when, when writing the piece, it was like, I think for all, I don't know, I think all of us as black people, sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're a teenager and you want to, because the character's quite young, when you're a teenager and your mom's, your mom's telling you off she's, and she's, she's not doing stuff you agree with and she, ah, she's annoying you, and you wish you could just, mom, I, but you can't, and it was kind of like this is the, his ideal scenario was like if I could just say, "Mom, stop, then please," you know. It was it was more coming from that. I, I, that's really good feedback. Um, I think when going back, when going back on it, because I would like to touch up that piece a little bit more. It would be it would be nice to kind of try and make that apparent. I don't know if that's something I would do at the beginning of the speech and say where it's coming from or, yeah. or what, but yeah, thank you Beautiful. for that. That's a great response. Thank you. Beautiful. Kwame, would you like to say anything about that, Kwame? Uh, uh, I, I I think I, yes, sir. I think in terms of resilience, um, I, I don't know how to answer that question properly, my sister. I can only say that we have to believe, have a level of self-belief in ourselves that lets us know that there is a door that has our name on it and inside of that door, beyond that door, contentment lies. And I'm just gonna keep trying to find that door no matter how many times people point me in the wrong direction or tell me that the room is the wrong room for me. I'm just gonna keep on believing. Hope, I think, is the key for me in terms of resilience. But that's a really weak answer. I'm really aware, and so I, I'm apologizing for just simply speaking about it at a surface level. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel very, I feel compelled to say something in response to, to the question that was being asked in relation to Aaron as well, uh, because I don't know Aaron, but I think what you did was brilliant, and I understood it as a piece of performance art, mm -hmm. not necessarily reflecting life. I can't imagine that that's a way you would speak to mm -hmm. So, I was totally okay with it. I totally, totally appreciate what was being said. Just We'd have to take a couple more questions. A um, couple more at the front. Yep, this guy first, and then maybe another one at the back. Um, it's to Kwame. Oh, my name is Akira. I'm just a student. Um, but, yeah, you talk about oppression that you suffered and that Malcolm X suffered being a structural thing. And it was mentioned as well that most black men and black boys don't really know how to articulate these feelings that you felt when you were feeling this rage. How do you, th what do you think is the best way of educating these men on sort of like ar articulating the feelings that they're feeling? I don't know that I'm the right person to answer that question. I, I, I certainly think that our brother here um, is equipped with, with far greater tools than I am. I can only speak for myself and for the, uh, my attempts with my sons. And I, I, I think for me, um, an understanding of history tells you what's happening tomorrow. Finding commonality with the thing, because we are, as human beings, we are a species that just repeats. Mm -hmm. History tells us that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so finding where you are in that continuum yeah. and slightly raising yourself 
slightly outside of the hustle of the day to day, I think is, is, is partly, uh, could partly contribute to understanding and getting yourself out of the uh, oneself, out of the trap that is set for you as a young black male. And it is a trap. And I, I, I'm sorry, can I just take one more second Please on this? <coughs> so, uh, this, this, again, nothing that I say do I perceive to be right. I only perceive it to be my opinion. And my opinion today, which might change tomorrow. But, the, 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 right, but, but the, now there's a, there's a Jedi mind trick that sometimes gets played on us as young black males, right? So I'd say historically, and that's about othering. So I'd say historically, we might understand that the European came to Africa, right? And it looked at black male genitalia and it went, oh my God, that's big. No, it was normal. <laughs> but what happened is, if we got called as young, and so much of us were growing up going, yeah, I've got big things. It referred to your, to your piece. But actually, when we then got to a point in history where we defined ourselves as black men, so the only thing we were allowed to do, which is the othering of, oh my God, we've got big things, so we're a sexual animal. And then we found ourselves in hip hop, holding on to our crutch as a defining aspect of who we are as a man. So our manhood had been fed to us, and our behaviors of that manhood was fed to us of an original othering. That's a Jedi mind trick. Your shit wasn't bigger, it was normal. If anybody thought it was big, it just meant that theirs was small. <laughs> so there was a, a complete, now I'm not saying that that's true, by the way. <laughs> just to be really clear, I, 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 I don't have knowledge of that. But what I do have knowledge of is being led into traps that define me and then manage my behavior. And so for us as young black, no, I'm not young black men, but for young black men, and uh, thank you, darling, I, I threw that one up on your assistant. Um, <laughs> and the, 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 for us, it is always about how do we look back at history and go, what were the traps that we fell into before and how do I not fall into it again in its modern guise? Yeah. Aaron, did you want to respond to anyone? You know, no? I think that was a great question and there are lots of people doing all sorts of good things. Even this is a way of trying to respond to exactly that concern. How do we encourage black men, black boys, other minority groups to give due consideration to self-awareness? And maybe this, seeing someone like Kwame sharing his own personal concerns, his own life, his own mental health history, how might that encourage people to think, well, this is of use to me? Um, maybe time for a couple more questions. One from the back and then another one at the front. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Jaden Ali and I'm a senior lecturer on the MArch course, which is the Master Architecture course here at Central St. Martins. And I just wanted to Could you stand, please, because I can't see who you are. Oh, great. Over here. Thank you. Hi. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a couple of things because I found this event to be really, really kind of empowering in some ways because actually what you're doing is sharing your, your story. And I wanted to kind of respond to the lady's comment over here in which, actually, Aaron, I think we must be honest with the stories that we tell, mm -hmm. even though, you know, that might not be appropriate in a different age. Actually, that is a very honest story for you to mm -hmm. tell now. And in this context, when you're, you're on the chair and uh, it's, a, it's a therapeutic session, uh, we must be kind of generous in some ways. Mm -hmm. As um. As someone who recently started therapy, I just wondered, as a practical tool, because your conversation is much about one's race, is there a space in which you can find black therapists? Because that's quite a difficult find thing for me to find. Who's that question for, by the way? I suppose the question is for you, because okay. I suppose in this room there are num probably a number of, yeah. of black therapists. Yeah. But when I was searching for therapists online, is there a place where you can go to? There's a sister down here that's yeah. waving her, her arm that might want to respond to it. Yeah. Okay, she's, she's a yeah. black therapist herself. Uh, very quickly, yes there are. There's a growing movement, if you like, of trainees and trained and qualified black therapists. The best known one is the Black African and Asian Therapist Network, Barton, and you can find that information. They have a fantastic website and a growing number of trained individuals. They do lots of projects for students and people interested in counseling and psychotherapy, which is great. 
Th we've also got direct links with, and I'm a member there too, um, with associations in the United States and of course a very small association that's growing in Africa. So yes, there is support for those people who are looking particularly or want to work particularly with a, a person of African or Asian descent. It's still a major problem. I mean, higher education, for instance. I mean, I was working in higher education institution over 20 years ago when I realized that there were no black counselors in, in HE. Here we are 20 years later, and it's still a challenging situation in HE and other industries. But it is changing. But, but Barton is probably the first place that you might want to go to. So that's a good question. Thank you very much for that. Barton, B-A-A-T-N, you'll find their websites, the um, Black African Asian Therapist Network. Okay, Hello, we have a question at the front. I'm Maureen, I'm a psychotherapist, Hi. and I work with men who have experienced trauma. Um, what I've found is that many men come to us at crisis point, and I'm trying to wonder what we can do to prevent that from happening, that they don't continue to suffer in silence, but get the help and support from a therapist that can give them that. I, 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 I can't answer to that professionally, of course, mm. and so I, I'll let you, but I, I You should be a counsellor, you're good at deflecting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but, thank you. Um, but um, but I, I would say, A, um, things like events like this is tremendously important. This is why I, I take my hat off to you. It's tremendously important to, to make sure that we get the message out that it's okay it's not weak to come early mm -hmm. at moments of depression, mm -hmm. at moments of an ang high anxiety, mm -hmm. um, and, and actually even that it's not white, mm -hmm. right? It's like it's got to go in there. And it's about that happening within our families as well. As I say, my challenge was my sister. My sister's challenge was to me was to say, I think that your, your philosophies around that are like 19th century, and it's damaging. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that with my sons and my children, that, um, that that is an option where they know there is no judgment from that. Go seek help that we can't give. Which is brilliant. We we'll probably can take two more questions, but I have a quick question for Aaron, if you don't mind. You've done fantastically well to get to the final year in a very good university. It's brilliant. I mean, you'll probably be aware. <laughs> yeah, definitely worth an you're probably aware, as a, a black male student, uh, you know, black students have challenges, you know, they're not likely to progress beyond year one, and even if they get to the final year, they don't get the same grades as their white counterparts. Even when they progress, they probably don't enter uh, the world of work at the same level as their white counterparts. Now, you're going into a profession as well, which has its challenges for mm. black men and black people, and I'm sure Kwame would uh, testify to that. So with all of that, you've done brilliantly well. What are your views and thoughts about the next step and where you are as a black male in, uh, in HE? Uh, I'm actually not quite sure how to answer that. Um, Sorry if it's too complex a question. <laughs> no, uh, could you perhaps like simplify it perhaps even a Well, you've done brilliantly well to get here. Yeah. What next? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope to have a healthy career um, working, working amongst my peers and and a lot, and a lot, and a lot more black faces. When I'm, if, if I'm honest about it, um, I think coming, coming to drama school, I was, I was worried about it because when I applied for, when I was, when I was applying for drama school, when I was at the auditions, I didn't see many of our faces, so I kind of felt like, I, I, I don't know that, that maybe not, not that this thing wasn't, not that acting wasn't for us, but that we weren't, I don't know, not necessarily interested in it, but there was, yeah, so, so, something along, along that. So I think going, going, going forward, I'd like to see more, I'd like to be, I'd li I'd like to be acting against, uh, alongside most, a lot, of me, a lot of people like me. And I would I'd say like that. I see a lot of people coming to drama school, Brilliant. coming into drama school yeah. that are like me. And I would say what's next for him is that he calls me because I gave him my email address. <laughs> And that I saw absolute talent. Like, not, oh my God, he's black and he's good. But I was just like, from the first beat, he composed the music <laughs> and performed it and wrote those words. I was just like, who is this dog? I'm like, so uh, the next move is, as I've said, you need to holler at me and let me uh, introduce you to my network. Now, this is important and this is great. And yeah, I'm really pleased to hear that. Thank you.
especially, especially, and just, just a political angle, I mean, I have to say this, I mean, you know, you've all heard of Oscar So White, uh, you know, the BAFTA So White, it's very, very important that we link up, have mentors, use the opportunity to speak with and work with other people who already have gone through the struggle, so that's very good, and thank you very much for responding to the question. Right, maybe a couple more questions. Um, one here. Hi. Um, I just want to say something Can about... Can you say who you are, please? Sorry, my mind. name's Cyril. I used to run an organisation called the African Caribbean Mental Health Association. Um, I just want to make the point that, although ACMA's gone a long time ago, there are many alternatives to, um, for people who are looking for health and therapy. You do not have to take the um, quote-unquote qualified route. There are ancient traditions and um, new dispensations where people um, are helping one another and supporting one another towards mental health and improve mental health. Have conversations. It doesn't matter whether the person that you have those conversations with are labeled a therapist or not. It doesn't matter whether they're qualified or not. Uh, ACMA helped hundreds of people. Yes, we had qualified services which were approved by the NHS, but we also had a, a group of therapists, counselors, um, who were, some of whom were volunteers and some of whom were paid, who also provided services. What matters is what works for you. Mm -hmm. So find and use the resources that are out there, even if they are not quote unquote qualified. Brilliant. A comment rather than a question. There was one in the back and I think right at the front here. Uh, so the one at the back first and then Good evening, um, Tutia Thomas, Health and Wellbeing Advocate. Um, so thank you for your very important and powerful um, sharing of experiences. Um, so we're in the UN International Decade for People of African Descent, and it's helped us um, with giving us the language of Afrophobia, thinking about um, structural and institutional Afrophobia, um, would you like to be involved in the UN International Decade for People of African Descent? And, um, and how can we uh, best uh, utilize your networks to make it part of the UK uh, uh, conversation on ending Afrophobia? Thank you. That's right, sister, take the opportunity. <laughs> Right in the public, I can't say no. no. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, let, let, let's connect afterwards and, 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 and let's talk about that. I, I, I support that. So uh, yeah, let, let's talk about that within being realistic around my time. Okay, there was a question here, which I'm afraid I'm going to have to make the last one. Hello. Hello, hi everyone. Um, I'm Anita uh, Israel. I am the Education Officer at UAL Student Union. Um, thank you so much for this discussion. Um, I think the thing that I picked up the most when you were speaking was the rage part. Um, feeling kind of, I'm, I'm feeling that at the moment. Um, representing students and kind of hearing them have similar experience to, what, to how your childhood was. Um, it's really, really hard to, to deal with, and to hear that in higher education um, is pretty devastating. And I guess the question that I'm asking is that there are academics in the room, there's people that represent students like myself, governors here. What can we do to better support um, our black students? Brilliant question. Uh, um, uh, again, a, a brilliant. <laughs> a, a brilliant question, and, 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 and forgive me if I'm not able to answer it with precision. Um, you know, it, rage can be used very well. Um, I described, in retrospect, my rage as a righteous rage. It was not wrong. I faced, and my community faced, not depression, oppression. And we faced it with, with uh, there was a vigorous, an aggressive edge to the impression that, that we faced. And, and you either die or you fight, right? And so we, we find many of our community, uh, communities at different ages just not knowing how to fight anymore. Because the rage turns inside 
and consumes. And then those who are closest to us feel that rage, and we don't know how to strike out <coughs> at it. And so, though I do not have the answer, what I can say is that my righteous rage was fortunate to be guided by love, by a parent who understood that my rage was righteous. You have to understand that it's righteous mm -hmm. in order, to, to, in order to, to be able to serve it. And we have to be able to, I think, and again, I'm a father, so it doesn't mean that I've got it right. I'm really aware that I still have a rage. Right now, and this is one of the things that I wanted to, to just end with, because I really don't want it to sound like, hey, I had periods of mental ill health, and now I'm the AD of the Young Vic, and hey, everything's great, and I don't have it, and I still have the rage, and I still have the mental fragility. On my way here today, I was told of an attack that's going to come towards me on uh, social media in the next week, and the rage inside of me for the disproportionate um, attack that can, so it can take me off the rails of thinking about what I'm going to produce next week. But ultimately, I have, to under, I have to rebuke the thing that wants to disrail me. I have to look at it in the eye and say, you shall not defeat me because I have righteousness on my side. And how we look at our children and our young people in the eye and say, I understand your rage and I know the direction that it's going in and let me cry with you and let me hug you and let me sometimes shout at you, but most of all, let me let you know, like this brother's piece was talking about, that I understand you. And brick by brick, Babylon will fall. <laughs> now, to just very quickly, Aaron, if you don't mind, I mean, the second part of that question really was what can the students' union, uh, teachers, and the academy here at the institution, the institution itself, what can it do more for black students like yourself? I mean, you've made it through. I mean, you know, you're almost at the end. I mean, you've got a piece of work tomorrow that you've got to do that I know you're going to do all right at. But is there anything more, I mean, is Anita's question, that can be done for, for black students here? I think, um, I, think I think this, I can only speak from my personal experience. Um, but I haven't, maybe it's that I've not, I've not, like, maybe it's not, I may have not looked well enough or whatever, but mm. I don't see that the things are, are there to, to come to. I don't see, like, a, what's the, what am I looking for? It's not obvious that the support like is there not, for you. Yeah, it's not that obvious to us okay. that it's there. Um, yeah. Well, my, my yeah, my, my friend uh, Joshua is also in my year. He does um, counselling, and he says that the, the counselling sessions here are really are, are really useful. So that's, that's something that's been extremely extremely well for him. Um, but yeah, I think just perhaps m reaching out to us more, maybe, or making it easier for us to reach out to you um, could be quite useful. I'm not sure how you'd go about doing that, but I, I yeah, I'd love to have more conversations about Thank you. going about that. That's brilliant. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really sorry. We've, uh, we've come to the end. I'm really sorry. Um, I have got a couple of thanks that I'm going to have to share with you. Um, I'm going to be around for a bit longer, so I can take some questions, and I'm assuming you'll probably be able to stay. So long as I can just dash to the toilet really yeah, quickly first, first, and then I promise that. I'll come back in the room. And Aaron, I know you've got to shoot up because you've got this thing happening tomorrow, so that's cool. But a couple of thanks, please. Um, so I'd like to quickly thank uh, Bumi, Sebastian, Julie from the comms team. Thanks very much for your support. Make this happen. That's brilliant. Um, also, um, as well, to, Mariki, uh, to Maria and Nikki from the counselling team for offering the support. I want to reiterate, there is some information material on the counselling table. Also, as well, some information from a couple of students who are studying counselling and psychotherapy and doing some research in the area. There's some details of that if you want to be involved on the table. Uh, thanks to Anna Atala. I hope you're here. Anna, student engagement officer, was really, really helpful right at the beginning of organising this and made direct contact with uh, Kwame right at the beginning. Um, and obviously, uh, thank you very much, Aaron, for the piece at the beginning. That was absolutely awesome. It's just fantastic. Thank you. Um, and of course, um, I want to thank very much Kwame for making himself available for this. It really has been. <laughs> And the final and 
biggest thank you, obviously, is to you out there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.